Shut up. Hey, it's me, your subconscious speaking. Turn me up, yo. Close your eyes. Now that I got you under my concentration, let's pledge allegiance. We are the rare. We are the strong. We are the meek. We're just not humble about it. We've been here since the beginning of time. And all wonders of the world in which we live in are products of our imagination. We are the dreamers. And as long as we dream, we will never die. You know why? Because no one ever really dies. We want to squeeze your. It's it's latency is so freaking frustrating with communication. Oh my god! And, and timing, it it's, it's on in my on my computer, Brent. You were like three quarters of a second after me. Yeah, and, I just, and you still had a straight face, and I was like, if we were in the same room and Brent <laughs> caught three quarters of a second after me, we'd have. We'd have we have a problem in the rhythm section. <laughs> but what's so funny, Brent, is that you are always like three quarters of a nanosecond ahead of me. Ahead in the groove. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a on top of the beat player, for sure. It's for sure. And, that's in and, my background, though. That's in my, that's in my upbringing. It's in your DNA, man, and yeah. it's part of the whole sound. It's part of the sound. Yeah. It's, it's like, that's, that's a rock and roll kind of sound. It's also like a, you know, certain types of funk. It's, it's a sound too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just the role that, that, that a certain instrument will play at its t certain time, you know, yeah. in, rela in relation to what kind of music it is or what kind, you know, Frusciante will be very on front of the beat, but then sometimes be so far behind the beat. It's crazy. You know, you know, if you have to ask would be a good example of that, you know? Um, I don't know how to play it. It's just, it's really hoppy in the, but when it gets to the chorus and he does these Donald, bang, uh, he's just kind of like, he's really letting it kind of slingshot more. Huh. The top of the song is, so if you think it, he's really on top of it so he's keeping it and when he gets to the chorus like all those like you know he'll he'll set them back a little bit so you get that slingshot effect interesting i think it's really interesting like this is i'm so interested in this this shit like blows my mind like the 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 relation of like patterns and how, because that's really a pattern in time, you know, like where you put it in time, where you put the music in the present moment or where you perceive the present moment to be, I think is very interesting. And also interesting is that people, when they're listening to it, they may not be able to say, Oh, that is ahead or that's behind. No. But, but the information that is embedded in where things are landing is so emotionally powerful. It, it is. It is. And if you, it is, as you said, it's a reflection of the person. And you said it's what you say. It's embedded in my well, past, my DNA. And 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 I think I've thought about this a ton. Like so, um, I'll send you guys the link. I was going to send you guys the link actually, but I'll send you the link. It's Jordan Peterson talked about this, and I I, I just like when he says it, it just like everything just lines up to me, but he talks about the relation to music, like how, what, like what relation to music and life. I can't remember exact question was um, on this podcast with what's his name, Akira the Don, that DJ that's been doing all this stuff with him. Hmm. But Peterson talks about it. So in, he talks about like music is such a, is such a relationship to, to life because there's patterns, you know, because, because, in music, it, music is is taking and harnessing all these patterns in, and it's and it's patterns in life. And it's it's patterns that we in life kind of attach to. So, 
you know what I mean? Like everything's like on a pattern. Like, well, I want to learn how to do something is kind of a pattern. Like there's our thoughts are our pattern. Everything's patterns, you know? There's a ton of patterns in life, right? We follow patterns and that's a survival mechanism, right? But if you, so I'm going to, in relation to that and what I was talking about in time is like, I think it's interesting that when you, okay, so you're playing music and there's a, there's, a, there's a perception. I don't know why Siri keeps on coming on. There's a perception of time, right? That, that spot where it is. And then when we, when we relate to that, how we relate to that spot or that perception of time it's really kind of like, God, this will get so deep and it's, <laughs> but it's kind of like life, right? Like it's like being in the present moment or like having that release or like, you know, there's, 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 and that, it, that can be looked at like a pattern that we kind of play out in music. We, we live that. And Peterson talks about that. Like we, 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 we live these patterns. We, we harness them. We, we, we get inside of them and we move inside of them, you know, and, and that is a relation to life. Like there's, there, it's, it's really deep. Peterson talks about it and he, you got to hear him break it down. Cause he's, he's a, you know, psychiatrist, a clinical psychiatrist. I didn't know he was a musician or was that musically sensitive himself. He's very like his, his, his like own, like it, it, it seems that his he 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 thinks that music is the closest relation to playing music is the closest relation to like how life kind of organizes its, itself huh. and and he also feels like i've heard him also say that like it's it's mu music that is is the transcend is is the place that can transcend it's where like the narrative meets the objective, like where the two, like, like in, in his way, I think it's almost like in music is like God, you know what I mean? It's, it's very interesting. He's got a very interesting perspective on it. He's very, you know, it's hard to disagree with pretty deep with that shit. <laughs> so. I think I'll open up for all that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that kind of stuff really blows me away. Hey everyone, welcome to the Others Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Penny. Uh, joining me this week, two returning guests. Um, I was hoping to have four guests, in fact, but some technical issues means we're down to two and then maybe a part two uh, to come in the near future. But I thought what we'd do as we're now in 2021, we are approaching a, a milestone, an anniversary uh, for us fans, and that's the, the 20th anniversary of In Search Of being released. I thought I'd reach out to you know the guys that were there from the start, the guys that actually played on the album or the um, the re reworked version just after the initial release. So joining me today, uh, Brent and Eric, welcome back, guys. Hey, hey, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Steve. So I have to say, first of all, we were just chatting before we started recording. Um, people won't be able to see this, but you're both sat there stunting in your OG customized one of one star trek jackets uh and i am thoroughly thoroughly jealous of those i do actually have some star trek questions coming up so we'll get onto that a little bit more i think as we go but yeah i just wanted to kind of bring you guys back just to, i know we've we've touched on in search of in the past in our uh different conversations we've had on the podcast but yeah i wanted to kind of get at least a couple of you guys together to kind of you know um talk about it a bit more and your kind of experiences at the time and, and how it kind of went. So I guess I'll kind of start with a, a question I think I've, I've kind of touched upon in the past with both of you guys. And that's, you know, when the, the project came to you guys and was, was pitched to you um, and you were asked if you wanted to kind of do this as a group and be involved, you know, what were your kind of initial thoughts and reactions to it? Well, Eric, you, you're the one who, delivered the news and I guess got and then delivered the news. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Steve, I remember, I, I remember getting a call from Eric. I was, I was, you know, I'd been listening to the CD at the time and I was like, 
I, I was like, damn, this is really great, <laughs> you know? And then Eric called me and said, how would you like to play on it? I was like, oh my God, absolutely. You know, that's, I mean, that was my response. I mean, everybody was really super excited, you know? And it was also a breath of, we had, we had lost our, lost our deal by that. Yeah, we were. The timeline is fuzzy in, we had, we had been history. dropped from Epic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, um, we've shared the story of how we met Pharrell. And we won't do it again here because it, that can take some time. But it was a small world event and Pharrell had come upon an older recording of ours. It was the recording that we were signed to Epic Records on the basis of. Epic had dropped us and... We got in touch with Pharrell when he learned that we were no longer on Epic and he was wanting to start a multifaceted collaborative relationship, but we didn't know what that meant. And <laughs> Pharrell had flown John out to record uh, with Khalees on Mr. UFO Man. And we didn't know what else may or may not be coming. And in uh june june late may june of gosh darn it 2021 i don't even know or not 2021 2001 uh he pharrell called my cell phone and said i have this group called nerd and we've made this album but we don't feel it's finished and would you spy mob be interested in flying out to Virginia Beach and recording the live instruments on it. And it's not like we had much else going on at the time. Yeah. And, and I mean, it wasn't much of a discussion. I don't think, um, I, I think, you know, we talked about it as a band and quickly we're like, this sounds really interesting and fun. And so as part of that conversation as well, you mentioned that John went and did some work with, Khalees as well did that kind of fall into the whole kind of I guess package that was on offer it was come and work on this album plus there may be other work available with the other artists or did that just kind of happen separately well it happened first that John worked with Khalees and he had a great time doing it and the you know when when we first met with Fer Pharrell um I flew out to New York to meet Pharrell right after it was determined that um, Pharrell knew we'd been dropped. He had been a fan of ours sort of on, you know, having come across an old recording of ours, he'd been a fan for a year or so. And then he was just really excited to work with us in what at the time were sort of uncertain ways. He was wanting to get us signed again. He had, high hopes for what spy mob would do and at the time it was really wonderful to come across such a um, an enthusiastic fan who was also doing really incredible groundbreaking work but it was not clear when we first met that there was anything like nerd on the horizon um it was in that call after john worked with Khalees in the spring of to 2001 that he revealed that there was this NERD project that they were reworking in some way. And then they sent all the Pro Tools files because we were using Pro Tools for our own recordings at that point. And we had all kinds of, do you remember the arranging ideas that we had yeah, for the we, album? And like, we, we tried were, a lot of different stuff. Yeah. We just messed around with a lot of different things and then brought that in. But I don't think much of it got used. <laughs> no, no, no. We we had Spy Mob always has arranging ideas, and like yeah. we we were putting synth parts down. Like yeah. we had all kinds of ideas. And I remember Chad on that first day was He's like, a... "Hey, nice, nice ideas. Okay, yeah, we're not using any of that anyway." Yeah, go, yeah. hey, Brent, go... play this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that said, that said, when it when it came to when it came to the instrumental. Uh, contributions that we made to that album. I mean, I don't know what your thought is, Brent, but I just, I felt like 
it was basically they i mean they gave us lots of latitude in what we did we were just trying new stuff around that time we did try like because we sat with it was chad you know the whole time i mean we would try different yeah try different things but yeah you know usually with those things you kind of like you know like lock in where i always tell people we lock into those those grooves that they have because you can't mess with those you know right yeah yeah so i was gonna say you didn't this once you got those um those kind of projects and those tracks you didn't get to yeah put your own kind of uh stamp on them at all it was just kind of yeah please please replicate this as close as you can to how it originally sounds almost well on that one that album we had a little more room that i I feel then like now like well because when i work with p now like there's not as much room maybe be and that there can be multiple reasons for that though too you know like it's no with NERD. There's still a lot of room. There is, yeah. You mean there's there's still more room with NERD stuff than there is. I will say outside of the NERD stuff in my world, at least for guitar. Like, you know, if I'm playing on stuff that Pharrell's produced for someone else, it's usually pretty straight down the line. Mostly because his his writing and productions are are so so well done and so well arranged that like trying to add other things in makes things a little bit just doesn't sound as good <laughs> you know no i was gonna say was it kind of the same for you eric obviously with pharrell kind of being a, a bit of a, a drummer himself um you know did you feel you had to just kind of you know, replicate what had already been put down or did you kind of get that did you feel you kind of had that that leeway to kind of do it in your own kind of manner as well well at the time so i i will say that during those during the in search of sessions, I f- was wonderfully surprised at how much freedom we had to explore as instrumentalists. As a drummer, when you're in the hip hop world, and NERD straddles a lot of worlds, but there's something about a drum set, especially the drum set that I had, which is not you know, a super tight little punchy drum set. It's Mm a, um, you know, an old Ludwig drum set with the intention being that it sound like a drum set. Um, And that can walk, that that can step on a lot of Mm. lyrical content. And so the, the drum machine work that had preceded the second version of In Search Of, the first version has really small, tight, drum programming Mm -hmm. and so in i knew that i had you know especially whenever there were lyrics or rapping happening happening it had to be tight you know i didn't want to be stepping on that but there's plenty of space between things for to really you know to really step out so you know rockstar has big freaking bombastic toms and and lap dance does as well. And um, so it was kind of like finding spaces to really show people, okay, this is a freaking drum set. You know, this isn't mm-hmm. a drum machine, but also kind of respecting the form as well. So when, when you kind of get those tracks, do you, what's your, what was your process? Was it listen to it as a whole together and then take away your own kind of individual, you know, I'll go sit over here and listen to the drum parts and work out what I'm doing. I'll sit here with the guitar parts and, work that out or is it more of a a collaborative thing yeah in in search of we we had did did we have the stems or the sessions before erica but i remember working on them for like a couple weeks before we went to virginia so we we had some time we we did but none of that work i did i didn't do any drumming forethought in in those we were just sort of it was such a sparse sounding recording to us we at the time were used to layering and layering and arranging and arranging and and I think I mean speaking personally, I felt like the initial in search of album when I heard it and the first time I heard it was when we were given the stems, the sessions. Yeah, yeah. It it, it really sounded unfinished to me. It sounded like, oh that that that's too lean to feel complete and yet 
it was so complete in its way. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I, it took us working on the album, as I think I said to Stephen a couple of years ago. It was like I didn't understand what Shay, Pharrell, and Chad were doing until we recorded the album, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, now I get it." Because yep. when I heard first heard it, it sounded wrong. Yes, the album. Hey, Eric, I, and I, then I, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was gonna say, yeah, I, sh- I, sh- I totally share that with you. Where it's like, like at first, like I think, I think it's just because of the history, right? Like you grow up, like, like Eric was, like you were saying, Eric. I think that's a really great observation. Is is how like the, the a real drum set, even even a real drum set that's tight has this sound that's more open. It's a drum set, you know what I mean? It's not as like pinpointed and tight, like. You know, and that gives this sound like this, like kind of big, you know, energetic thing, you know, and it's inevitable. You you hear a chorus with a drummer going to the ride cymbal, you know, it's just like it's blowing up like it, there's no ifs, ands or buts about it, you know. So when you heard this album, like for me that at first when I heard it, like I I was like, yeah, you kind of think, well, well, no, it needs to blow up in the chorus or, you know, because you're just stylistically that's what you're used to. But I like, I was just saying like, Eric, I feel exactly like you do is like after then you sit with it and you're like, I get it. Like I totally get what you guys are doing and it's genius. It's, it's, but am- it, it, it's amazing. Like, you know, it, and what's funny is that it took making it to get yes. It. Yes. Yeah. And stepping back and like, yeah, we would, uh, but the sessions themselves, I remember the way I recall it is once we got there and we were in the room and, you know, at the time, Pharrell was across town producing Brandy during the day. Was it? Yeah, when we it were, when you, I think it was Brandy. And so it was mostly Chad in there. And I think we would go in mostly one at a time mm-hmm. and work on, uh, and it was 10 days total. But yes. it was such an easygoing trial and error process with not a lot of like second guessing. Yes. Yeah. And just super, super fast and easy and fun. Like I don't remember being stressed during the 10 yeah. days at all. That's a different working process with Pharrell and Chad that we weren't used to too, because like we had made the spy mob album and that like, you know, we were in, we were in production for the spy mob album. I mean, you know, we, we worked on our own, before we knew we were going on in and then worked with a producer and then worked for six weeks on the album, you know? So there's much more like there was, you know, and like we were used to layering and, you know, they were like simple, you know, like, yeah, it was just a different process, but it was, it, I remember like thinking like, wow, this is like, that was some good years of college for me. You know, like, like going from making a rock album and that kind of mindset to going to making this kind of mindset and, and seeing the, the kind of the beauty in both of the processes and and how, you know, they work in different ways. And it's, it's really cool. And then then, you know, Pharrell and Chad are really like taking the mix of that rock and roll. They know like what happens when you go to the ride symbol, you know, and if you add that to program drums, like it's pretty cool because that wasn't as done in those times. So that was pretty, to me, I was like, wow, this is pretty genius, you know, add harmonic content, the, the depth of the harmonic content to it, it just puts it over the top. And did you guys kind of, you say you kind of turned it around quite quickly in 10 days or so, Mm -hmm. but did you, did you find the album itself a challenge in terms of, it's not just a straight hip hop album. It's not a rock album. You know, it crosses, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, it crosses so many genres mm-hmm. and it bounces like a lot of NERD, um, NERD albums. It bounces kind of all over the place at times. Was that a challenge in itself to kind of go from almost one genre to something completely different almost? Not, I don't think it was for us. Cause like. Not for professionals. Well, like you. no, no, not because of that. Because no, because we, we loved like, we were pretty, we, we, we were into exploring, you know, as a band, like we didn't just stick on one, like we'd been a band for a while. We had went through 
different like kind of processes or different stylings and you know what I mean? Like we try different things, you know? Um, and I think, I mean, for me, I was always excited to, you know, wow. It's like, okay, now we're going into, you know, Bobby James land and, and from rockstar, like, you know what I mean? Or I, I thought it was, I love it. The most critical component for me of understanding what we were doing in the studio didn't come until we met NERD fans. And that might, might sound strange, but that album is so unique in how it sounds. I didn't know, I couldn't, I couldn't complete the context of the album in my mind because, I mean, it, it wasn't difficult moving from song form to song form, genre to genre within the album, but it didn't, that album did not make sense to me until I met and talked to the fans and understood their perspective and why it made sense to them. That might, again, sound strange, but in, when there's an album that comes out that doesn't sound like anything else, which is one of the coolest things I feel about that album is that it just doesn't sound just like, like yeah. anything else. Like I was, I was, I was admittedly confused about what I just was part of until I met the people who love it. And then I'm like, I see you are curious, nerdy geniuses who come in all shapes and sizes and colors. And you're this wonderful mix of adventurous uh, searchers. And then I was like, oh my God, now I see what the heck we just did. And it's freaking cool. And that's what I always kind of found at the shows as well. Yeah, I think I went to, up until I moved away from the UK, I went to every London show that Pharrell had done. So I think I've been to 14, 15 of them now. Mm. But going to all those kind of early shows in the early 2000s, it was always such a mixed and eclectic crowd from you know teenagers up to kind of older people. Um, and you would meet people there um, that didn't even know them as you know the Neptunes. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know they produced all, all these kind of you know, huge smash hit songs, you know, in the early two thousand, late nineties, early two thousands as well. They were just like, oh yeah, I heard this album. It's an amazing album. I'm really into, you know, I'm a big jazz fan, and I, I noticed I, you know, took all the kind of jazz side from it and was really interested. Mm -hmm. So I came to see them. Then you would at the same time have people there, you know, young teenage girls because they love the kind of hip hop and the pop sort of songs that Pharrell was working on. They love, you know, him himself. Um, so there was always that kind of crazy eclectic mixture of of people, which I always kind of loved about those shows as well. Um, and as you say, you know, love about the album in itself, because I think the album and the fans, they kind of, you know, reflect upon each other and represent each other because that album is very eclectic in itself as well. As I say, you know, it covers so many genres. And as you mentioned, Eric, you know, I think when I first listened to it, I was of the same. I kind of listened to it and was like, what what the fuck is this like yeah you know, i i know the guys who produce it i know super thug and i know you know all these kind of neptune's tracks but what am i listening to here and it took me i think the, the first day i had the cd i listened to it probably four or five times just back to back just to kind of you know understand what was happening in each track and understand what was involved in each track um and yeah it's uh yeah, as I say, yeah, e eclectic and complex and at times confusing until you actually spend time with it, understand it, and then it all kind of all, all kind of makes sense, I guess. So when you were um, working on the sessions, and you sort of briefly touched on it, was was there anything, any parts in there that, you know, you, you desperately tried to stay true to, don't touch whatsoever, just replicate and on the flip side, is there anything where you kind of personally thought, okay, I've got I've got my own way that I kind of want to work this, and then maybe it didn't come off, or Chad or whoever kind of didn't like it? I don't know. Uh, I think it was I always want I gotta listen back to it, and Steve, you'll probably is that ascending lick in Rockstar? Is that in the original? Na, 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 na. You know that little ascending riff like i think i believe it uh, is is it okay I, I, I can't remember what like kind of parts we like there was some parts we really expanded on in there eric i think rocks <laughs> you know why you can't you know <laughs> why you can't 20 years <laughs> you know the reason why you can't remember is that 
it was a blur. It was a, everything was so fast. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> there's, there, there wasn't, you know, a lot of every, every artist collaboration is different. And Brett and I have done each countless sessions with other artists and everyone has a different way of working. And I don't think I have ever been in a session that was that light and that fast. And I mean, I went through all the drum tracks and I, I mean, we were only there 10 days. It must have been three days. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And you know what it is? It is. And that's how Chad, because Chad is so like, because it, Chad, I, now when, think, when I'm thinking back to it, Chad is so like creative. His brain will just be like, let's give this a shot. Let's, you know, like his, his production styling, I think is that kind of, he will, he'll kind of mold through a few things and then, and then you don't even know you just got it like all of a sudden. And so That's right. like, I, I feel like there, when I remember back and even thinking to like working with Chad and, you know, recent years, that's kind of how we, you know, he just moves fast. So it's hard. I can't really quite remember because Chad was just kind of molding things so fast and their creative process is it's super fast. It's very quick and very gut instinctual too. There were a couple of songs that I do remember having. Um, I do remember like feeling, I remember on provider. I don't know. I don't know if that song was, recorded to a click i mean i know there on the original version there was some electronic drum component but it's kind of herky-jerky and yeah you know the and the vocals were already recorded when we when we put on our part so yes yeah i, re I remember feeling like i remember feeling super self-conscious at the time that my drumming was not melding in a smooth way with the other rhythmic elements on there and when i listen to it now I still hear what I heard then, but it makes sense to me now. But it's not this smooth, groovy feel. It's really kind of, yeah. I remember thinking at the time, this is not done. But Chad determined that it was, and, and it's now Provider. Yeah, which is great. yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some things in there that I, I listened to the album recently, and there's some things that are lo like looser than I would have been okay with like it you know so right. I would I know I would have said like now I would have said hey can I try that again or you know what I mean but. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's like, got like you, you kind of go, well, no, there's no way. Like it, it just wouldn't be right. Like it, right. it's like, it's so perfect in it's imperfection and it's, and it's kind of just like the, there's a clear, there's a clear heart element to the album, right? Like it just kind of like feels like the takes are, are kind of like, nope, that's it. No, no overthinking it. Like, well, right. Yeah. Like I don't even remember, I don't remember recording lap dance. I, I mean, I don't even know where that came from. I mean, I remember playing it a hundred thousand times in shows afterwards, but I don't remember the original know, recording. And like, and like, cause, cause the, the classic feel too, Daryl would always talk to or what, what is the, Oh, and things, things are getting, things better. are getting better. Like that's you though. Right. Like you just like, you were like, oh, well, we at, need, the, we need at the time, at the time I was, yeah. At the time I was uh, thinking, you know, maybe maybe I could do something like happens before Michael Jackson's uh, Rock with You. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe I could try a few things. But yeah, I just and uh, that's another moment that I do remember thinking. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe I could do, do something here. Yeah. That's super, yeah, that's super cool. I remember on, um, yeah, provider, like one of those that I used the acoustic guitar provider, right? It was a provider with the right, right, right. string. Yeah. Oh, no, um, no, no. Um, we'll go up and have the same. Dude, I can't believe I, I never played about 8,000 times, right? Was that it? Did you use a classic? No, I used, a classical, I used a nylon string and the nylon string was so, it was a terrible guitar. It was, <laughs> uh, it was a horrible guitar <laughs> and, and that's all we had. And, and so isn't there that, you know, there's a, that part uh, and and when I did the ending of it, I had to do it in Chad, like 
because I had to bar it at some point to get these open strings. So I played that and then Chad would bar it for me at the time I needed it. To, so I actually played, I had to, that guitar part was played with Chad's assistance. <laughs> I, I hope he gets credit. I was about to say, does he get guitar credit? I don't know. Album? I don't know. We, we should, uh, but yeah, oh I, was, I always remember that thinking like that, because that, that's the only nylon string we had around and it was, kind, it was really kind of junky. It was, it might've been just like a student model or something, you know? And we were like, ah, it's, let's just make it work. <laughs> like, but that's like, that's the genius. That's, that's what makes that album. You know, that's the kind of the spirit of that album, you know? Yeah. So when you guys kind of came to, you know, finishing up and the album obviously kind of comes out, gets re, well, I was gonna say re-released, gets released in North America and in other places as a kind of different version. Had you already had conversations about kind of, you know, touring with those guys and touring the album or did that come as a kind of separate thing? I remember it being very up in the air. You know, I, 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 my, my sense when we recorded that record was this was really fun. This was a very new approach to making an album. But like I said, I didn't, and I think collectively we weren't sure what we just did. We didn't know how that was going to fit in ever, anywhere. It didn't sound like hot in here. You know, it didn't sound like other productions that, the Neptunes were doing at the time. We, it didn't seem to f fall into any category of, you know, what bands were touring in support of. Uh, but we knew that, that was possible, just given the likes of, you know, Pharrell and Chad. And so I think, and again, at the time, we weren't uh, sure of what our own, what we ourselves were going to be doing. We were going to be, John was writing and we were going to be working on new material, but we didn't have a, 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 our calendar wasn't full, let's say. And so when we heard that, you know, it, it started with just a smattering of shows. We did a couple of New York mm -hmm. shows. LA, we did, I believe Viper room. Like yeah. I remember doing a Viper room show really, really early. Yeah. Just sort of like testing the waters and then, I know for I was with Marty Diamond at the time. Yes, a, that's right. As a booking agent. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we had a series of shows. And then over the, gosh, I, I'm, I, I can't freaking remember. So what is Mar the March uh, 2001 day release date? Is that when our version came out? No, so I think the I think the European one was August two thousand and one. Then your oh. one was March two thousand and two. So why ah. does it say "In Search of" was released March twelfth two thousand one on Google? Because it's because that version. that was the original electronic version in Europe. That's right. Okay. 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 So it was so thank you for reminding me of my life, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, me too. Because so we recorded July, late June, early July, because we were there for the Fourth of July in Virginia Beach, super sweltering day at the beach. I remember, remember. so hot, so freaking hot. So that was July two thousand one, mm -hmm. and then and then and then uh, nine eleven freaking happens. Yes, and when we don't know. Wait, so we recorded July of 2001 and the album came out here in August in in Europe just after that the electronic version, yeah. No, 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 we recorded after the electro electronic version was released in Europe. Yeah. It was released in Europe and then pulled and then Pharrell was like, let's redo it. Let's okay. climb up. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't remember he pulled it. Yeah, so those original ones are quite. Um, they've got a different cover as well on the CD. They're quite, quite rare, quite hard to to come by nowadays. I think I've got two copies in my my mum's loft back in the UK somewhere. But yeah, I think it was out for. I want to say four months, maybe three or four months, but in and obviously it only got a European, a limited European release. But they put hardly any um, promotional marketing behind it, so. It didn't really sell because nobody knew who NERD were really. You know, it had a sticker on the front saying 
from the producers, the Neptunes, who have had hits, you know, I've got the poster over there, you know, give it to me and Super Thug, whatever. So people would see that in the shops and go, oh, well, I know those guys, go and buy it. But bar that, there was, if I remember rightly, over, over in Europe, there was hardly any promotion. And that's how I first came across the album, was that it was in our local HMV store. And my girlfriend went over there and it, they used to do these, like, you know, buy, you know, f- five albums for £25 or something mm-hmm. from a selection and again she just picked it up because she knew that i liked hip-hop and knew those songs and you know it was on on sale it had only been out a month or two or something because they just couldn't shift them she bought it home and was like i've listened to it i don't like it do you want it and i was like well yeah i'll give it a listen yeah the rest is history but yeah it wasn't long after that that yeah you, you then couldn't couldn't find it anywhere basically where i think the moment i felt like there was Correct me if I'm wrong, Brent, but the moment I thought, like, okay, this is gonna be a thing, is when we, when we, I learned, we learned that we landed that first Sprite liquid mix to her. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe so. Right, that was us with that tour was. I'm not gonna she... remember everyone, but I yeah. remember Hoobastank was. On yeah, it was Hoobastank <laughs> and. That wasn't Jay Z. That wasn't the Jay Z one, though. I don't think so. No, oh, okay. that was like the next year. But the Roots, I think, were on it. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know that whole. I got to go back and reconstruct that time because it was just a freaking blur. It was touring's like that though. Touring is so blurry. It was like I don't know where I was. <laughs> like I gotta look at the calendar. Yeah, because I think, but you know, from from O one to. When did In My Mind come out? Was that 06, I think? That was so you got 06. this kind of four. Yeah. yeah, so you got this kind of four or five years in the middle. Like, you know, I'd go see Pharrell, you guys, whoever it was, you up in London, probably once, at least once or twice every single year. Um, plus, obviously, you would do London, plus Manchester, maybe, plus Glasgow or Edinburgh and other places as well. So, yeah, obviously, for those years kind of ticking over, there was obvious, obviously you know, a lot of a lot of tour work I think going on for you well, guys. There, there was a time when that one hotel on Trafalgar square felt like my second home. I don't, I can't remember yeah. what it was like. Yeah. It was like a Marriott, but it was right on Trafalgar square. And we would have these rooms that were like, that were overlooking Trafalgar square. I was like, I can't believe I'm here yet again this year. Dude, that was so much. I used to love that. And we'd get to that area, staying in that area too. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's amazing. And I just wanted to touch on. You've got the Star Trek jacket, so um, <laughs> it'd be remiss of me not to not to talk about Star Trek a little bit. And you and you'll have to correct me with the the kind of timelines here. But around 2003, we've got your own album released on Star Trek, um, and also you. You guys had a track featured on the Clones album, was it uh, Half Steering? Which one of those kind of came first? Was it your album or was it the Clones that came out first? Do you, do you well, remember? Well, to, just for clarification, we never released an album on Star Trek. We did, however, get signed to Star Trek uh, when L.A. Reid formed the deal with, with Pharrell and Chad. Okay, so, so the album didn't actually come out under Star Trek. Yeah. Right, so we had made this album for Epic. We were dropped from Epic, but we got the album back. Uh, Pharrell loved the album and wanted to see it come out. But we were still in the process of working out the marketing uh, with Arista when Pharrell and Chad and L.A. Reid went separate ways. Um, so the al- our album later came out on Ruthless Records, which is um, Easy E's old label, um, then run by his wife, uh, Tamika. Um, but at the time, our album didn't come out. But yeah, Half Steering, Half Eating Ice Cream came out on that compilation, that Star Trek compilation, which was a unique contribution to that compilation. Yeah, so there's only there's two tracks on there that are you know, rock tracks. There's, there's your one in um, high speed scene. High speed scene. High that's speed the other one. Yeah. yeah. And they're the only two tracks that aren't produced by Pharrell and or Chad as well. Is that a track that you kind of had in your locker already? Or was mm-hmm. that something you did because they asked for something for the compilation? 
think we had it in the locker. Uh, yep. In um, in 1998, John started writing a batch of songs that that really started to sound like they could find a wider audience. And um, we had recorded a six song EP before that, a full length album, other recordings. But that was, in my mind, I think the first of what were, you know, a, a, a series of songs that we were like, hey, this, you know, this, this is sounding both like Spy Mob and also more commercial. Yeah. And we, that was one we produced with um, Alex uh, Awana, Alex, yeah. who was our engineer, producer, co-producer in, in those, those days. And... Yeah, it was it, it that's a, a song that was only released on that compilation and it hasn't been well I guess we released it as what? Did that ever did we ever release that song? Was that remember. on our demos? Oh, was that on the six <laughs> yeah, that was on the six song EP. Was it on the six song EP? Yeah, okay. Sorry, Steven kind of blurs around. Yeah. I'm actually gonna double check that because I'm not <laughs> sure that it is. <laughs> Uh, some of these Steven, t- yeah, I just blurry. <laughs> um, yeah, I always say now, now at this age, I I struggle to remember what I had for for dinner yesterday. I mean, let alone, <laughs> yeah, let alone what I was doing for work twenty years ago. Yeah. So yeah, um, I believe it was, but yeah, that I remember that too, Eric. That that was kind of one of those. That I felt like that was one of those songs at the beginning of the stage of us, or J- John was really writing this batch of songs that were a little bit had it felt like they'd have a could have a bigger audience you know before that we kind of you know our our first album kind of we did was like seven eight minute songs you know and like really super super arty you know so that was one that kind of got a little more into the quote unquote pop rock range i guess you know and was that a case of those guys hearing it and saying we could include it or did they come to you and say you know have you guys got anything you want to contribute? Well, the I just, I did double check it. That song is on the six song EP that's just called Spy Mob. And okay. we made, we recorded those six songs and we felt like, I mean, that we were doing it all ourselves in terms of finances, but I can't say that without saying a, a thank you to our old friend who's no longer with us, John Cooker, um, who donated a lot of amazing recording time at a special studio in Minneapolis, no longer there called CD underbelly. And we made these, the, these six recordings, we really believed in them and we started shopping them around and we were talking with a Chicago office, uh, Columbia records in Chicago. They offer, offered us a, a demo deal. We turned it down we got this album into lots of folks hands and we finally got it into a couple of attorneys hands who really uh, uh, fell in love with these six songs. And we started shopping it around to publishers and it was someone at famous music publishing who got a copy of this album that just happened to hand it to Pharrell one day and Pharrell in the summer of, gosh, I don't know, 2000, 1999, I don't know. But he talks about the summer that all he did is drive around and listen to our six song EP. So he knew all those six songs. Um, he loved Walking Under Green Leaves was a favorite of his. I, I honestly don't know why Half Steering, Half Eating Ice Cream was the one that was chosen. Yeah, I don't know. I was, I was going to ask you, yeah. And it, before you said that story, I was like, yeah, he was obviously listening uh, yeah, I'm not sure why it was chosen. Maybe it was it was just it was just one from the batch that we didn't put on our album, maybe or wasn't intended for our album. Maybe is the reason why. Maybe so because it didn't otherwise have a home. Yeah, it really does because it's it's really kind of fits into the sitting around keeping score kind of. It's it fits under that umbrella of time. So that might have been the reason. And when the album did finally come out did it remain unchanged as to how it was previously when you wanted to put it out or did the work you've been doing 
influence it in any way to you know update anything or change anything you mean when our full album sitting around keeping yeah. score finally came out in 2005 i don't think we changed anything did we eric no we did change yeah. one thing you we we put a copy we we spliced two different versions of the song thinking of someone else together we did that and we also added i still live at home and we added i still live at home that's right yeah so there was a copy of of thinking of someone else the song we did which is pretty interesting we did a whole version with one our producer steve moroni but we did another version with with alex awana but we spliced those two together so it's like the chorus is i think from alex's or the verses from Alex's version and the chorus yeah. is from Steve Laroni's. The the songs yeah. are actually totally sliced together from two complete different <laughs> performances. I'm gonna have to go, I'm gonna have to go back and listen to it. It's again, really then. cool though. Eric had the idea. Eric came up with the idea and and said, I think I think it'll work. And he spliced it together and it was like we were like, oh, that sounds great. <laughs> Let's do that. So that's the only difference. And putting on I still live at home. It's interesting because I was listening to to that album um, again over the weekend. Was it or Friday or Saturday, whatever day it was? Because I hadn't heard it in a little while, and I thought so I'm chatting to you guys, so I'll go back and listen to some bits. And it was it surprised me kind of how Nerd esque it parts of it actually mm-hmm. sound. Mm-hmm. You could take certain tracks or certain parts of tracks, and they would sit within or could sit within you know an in search of type album quite nicely how so i can't hear i actually cannot hear that at all no it's maybe my my untrained uh ear but there were certain parts of it there were certain drums in there and certain synths that you could hear oh yeah um, where i was like oh that sounds a bit like whatever track it would be on on in search of or i could kind of hear certain similarities and i guess I don't know I may be completely making up in my mind because I'm sat there listening to it for a purpose but but yeah I I could kind of sort of pick out little bits and pieces that I was sort of thinking yeah that that wouldn't sound amiss on that album over there or that album over there so that's why I kind of wondered if there was any kind of influence that um you know working with those guys kind of had on any of that that body of work that you then put out I was just gonna it just in reply to that like it would be it that NERD, that whole experience has made an incredible impact on me and how I, I mean, just musically, it was super powerful. Oh, yeah. And yet, I don't think, you know, that album that we had started working on really in 1998, um, which ultimately came out in 2005, that had its so much its own world around it, but mm-hmm. I don't think it was impacted much um by the NERD experience. Yeah, because it, it, it started off like in its own world and we kind of pretty much kept it in that, yeah. Great to get an insight from you guys um, again. Uh, I know whenever I speak to anyone that listens to the podcast, um, the episodes that every person always says, oh, I love are the ones with either Brent or Eric every time. Uh... Even though... And I have to say, no disrespect to yourselves, but you know, I've had Shay on the podcast. <laughs> and, and people are still like Brent and Eric, Brent and Eric. So, um, so no, I, I know people. You know, a, a lot of the fans, a lot of people listen to the podcast. Um, you know, they love the album, they love the work that you guys did and that you do, and yeah, they, they love kind of hearing these kind of you know behind the scenes type things and getting these little tidbits of information. And I do as well personally. So, you know, thank you again. For, for jumping on the podcast. It is very much appreciated. I know the the fans um, and listeners also really appreciate it. I'm not quite sure if I will, if I can sit on this episode until August or the following kind of March or whether it will go out before. I think once I've edited it up, <laughs> I like the drum and the jacket. That's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> A small rendition. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'll sit on this or if, if I'll actually put it out at the anniversary or whether we'll maybe splice it together if I can um, tie down Christian and, and John as well um, for a part two. We'll have to see how that goes. But yeah, I guess I guess that's it for now. Um, we'll kind of leave it. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I will put uh, I'll put the links in the, in the show notes where guys where people can kind of follow you guys. I think I've got all those from our previous chats. 
but yeah, I think that's it for now. So yeah, thanks very much, guys. Really, really appreciate it. Yes. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. Always good seeing you. And the audience, I imagine, our audience, I imagine too, is 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 primarily like I think fans are a lot of fans are like artists too, right? Like loads of them in, are, yeah, yeah, lot. yeah. In the, which is why they like the kind of you know the the behind the scenes type stuff and hearing yeah. how things were put together and made and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's why they like your episodes. Have you ever uh, are you able to get Tyler's attention? It has been put in front of him. Um, and then I think I texted you guys, maybe it was, it was last year or something, was it? We were talking about this kind of anniversary and reunion type stuff. And I know somebody that put that in front of Tyler to see if he could, you know, mention it to certain people. Mm-hmm. If there was, you know, obviously, if, yeah, there wasn't the pandemic and something in the water was still happening. There was a, you know, a, a potential opportunity there maybe to do something. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If he took it any further, I, I say let's do a reu- an NERD twentieth year reunion uh, without Shay, Pharrell, and Chad, and just have Tyler. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he probably would. To he, be fair, he, could, he he would he would remember and know all the songs better than everybody too. Yes, he's like a for sure. steel trap. I mean, what I love is stuff, I'm sure, man. I, he I, he'll I'm, straight. I'm sure that. Yeah. <laughs> no go. Oh, it's, it's like man, he 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 could answer all these like now that was that version and this version like he's he knows it, man. He's a he's an encyclopedia on that stuff. Totally. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing cuz he's um yeah, he's one of those like sort of super fans and people that I've kind of been aware of over the years as well, but I was never never really a fan of his for quite a long time like the early stuff. But you see, like his last album, like Eagle, such a good album, and you can Bro, really see of, the dude, the Eddie RD and Pharrell and <laughs> Neptune's influences. Ego is, <laughs> Ego is a beast of a record, yo. Like that is yeah. insane. Like I know, yeah, and you, it's obvious. It sounds very Pharrell influenced, but but yeah. it's still it's still Tyler. Like I mean, it's still him, it, and you still hear his his voice. To me, is is still clear. And that record. Oh, yeah. He's, he's- my daughter. My daughter has a, she's 13 and she has a huge Tyler poster in her room. And, you know, my daughter loves me, but she doesn't think I'm very cool. <laughs> so, uh, so every so often I, I just have to like poke her and say, you know, you know, that guy on the wall, he's, <laughs> I, there was a time that he, uh, he liked what I was doing. Yeah. It's just like, shut up, Dad. You're not cool, Dad. Uh-huh.